For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. My concern was always, how do we, in, in this situation of global, national, familial, and personal types of darkness, how do we find and recognize the moments of, of light? How do we latch onto them? And maybe even more importantly, how do we not lose what I think is a basic Christian conviction? And that is the conviction in uh, what I've called primordial goodness. That is to say that goodness is always most fundamental than anything evil that happens uh, in the world. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Happy New Year. And as it happens, happy 100th episode of For the Life of the World. March 28th, 2020 seems like, um, well, it seems like some quantity of time ago, almost two years ago, in fact. And that day, with all sorts of uncertainty in the world, we launched this podcast with an episode entitled Faith in a Time of Pandemic. And some of you have been with us this entire time. And for that, we are incredibly grateful. Maybe you're newer. We're just as grateful that you are here now with us. We're excited about the next 100 episodes of For the Life of the World. Conversations, stories, topical series, and other podcast goodies are all in the works. But for now, we're going to pause, sort of. Over the next four months, we'll run highlights, summaries, lectures, readings, and other best of features from our first 100 episodes, as well as a backlog of resources by the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And we'll be back with brand new interviews, reflections, and fresh content on May 1st. You can still expect an episode to release every Saturday, and we'll be combing through past episodes for the best moments from our amazing guests over the past two years. Today, for our 100th episode, Miroslav Wolf joins me to answer questions from some of you. A big thank you to all of you who responded over social media with thoughtful and honest concerns, questions, hopes, and fears as we enter 2022. And along the way throughout the conversation, I quiz him about what he's been reading and teaching recently, some of his writing habits, and into some interesting theological and political territory, talking about the loss of the middle ground in our polarized era. And here, Miroslav questions whether middle is even a Christian category. We talk about the primordial goodness of the world and seeing suffering with one eye squinted, and whether theology is for the religious only or indeed for the life of the world. Thanks for listening, friends. Miroslav, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Hope it's happier than the last one. <laughs> Indeed. It's also still Christmas. So uh, Merry Christmas in this season. I've often thought Christians ought to celebrate Christmas for the full 12 days of the season, but it's so easy to forget. Yeah, we front load it quite a bit these days and, uh, it, it, you know, get into the Christmas spirit. Um, I always like the idea of having your Christmas tree unveiled on the morning of the Christmas day itself and then yeah. go into 12 days of Christmas because you're kind of waiting for something. It's an Advent time, yeah. anticipation of what it is coming so that when the day comes, you experience kind of this sense of here the promise is with us at this day. And in any case, in some ways, joy ends up being more in anticipation often than it is in, in the reality itself. It's so true. It's so true. And I know you have a, a young one. Is Mira four now? She's four. Yeah. I've got a th three-year-old, Gus. And yeah. I don't know about Mira, but every day, Gus, <laughs> Gus is in <laughs> full of anticipation for Christmas. <laughs> And it's, it's pretty amazing to see that season through the eyes of a young child. And I love that depiction of joy, uh, joy in the anticipation and not just in the fulfillment. Yes. So you recently asked your followers and our listeners, of course, to weigh in with a few questions, concerns, hopes, and fears as we are entering 2022. And the response from many of our friends showed so much concern for both the future of humanity and the future of Christianity. But there's these worries, the worries that are out there, the fears that are out there include, 
the rise of authoritarian government, the continued breakdown of public discourse, the widening gap between the left and the right, certainly in America, but you know, this is apparent in, in, on the international scene as well. Proliferation of conspiracy theories and the post-truth element, violence and war, and these fears and are, are even on a personal level. Some folks responded with just kind of bearing their heart about worries that their plans and their careers would might be foiled by catastrophes that are out of their control. And yet there was also a very palpable real hope and commitment to finding the good and the true and the beautiful in the future that is before us. But I wanted to ask you, as we, we're going we're to discuss some of these things in this episode, what are some of your personal concerns, hopes, and fears as we look at the year ahead and where you find yourself? You know, generally, I reflect about this past uh, two years and a, a kind of a dark cloud in which we are enveloped and in which we have to live. My, my concern was always, how do we, in, in this situation of global, national, familial, and personal types of darkness, mm. how do we find the, the, and recognize the moments of, of light? How do we latch mm -hmm. onto them? And maybe even more importantly, how do we come to, how do we not lose what I think is a basic Christian conviction? And that is the conviction in uh, what I've called primordial goodness. That is to say that goodness is always most fundamental mm. than anything evil that happens uh, in the world. And I feel that we're in danger of losing that perspective. Um, mm. The negative has such a incredible power to make it itself more important and more threatening than it is. And that's part of its power, I mm. think. And mm. that makes it then easy for us to forget and not to recognize even small rays of light and see in the small rays of light something big that, that may come up as I'm speaking now. I'm thinking about the Magi and yeah. the star that appears, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I mean... Think of that. There's a light, there is a star that, that appears, and there's this little child that's at the end of this long journey. Mm. There is kind of search to find nothing there, mm. search to find something that is turns out to actually be something, but it looks like nothing. Yeah. And being in a situation in which we find ourselves, my question is, how many times do we pass about something, in, by something that's really important and we deem it to be nothing because darkness has enveloped us and the thing that we are observing. It's really a kind of challenge of the attention and, and turning the attention and, the, and our focus to align more deeply with our priorities and align more deeply with, with our values and principles. But that attention, right, like, like just missing something. It seems like we, we, we do so often have our heads somewhere else, and then we miss these very significant moments where, you know, to quote Leonard Cohen, where the light gets in. Yeah, yeah. And, and in some ways, I think it's, it's kind of the fears that always surround us, in, especially in difficult times as these are. They divert our attention away from what might be actually our salvation. Mm. Do you have things that you practice like with your family, with yourself, or, or with friends that, that kind of help to cultivate a, a tuned attention to just the sorts of rays of light that you're talking about there? So I'm often brought back to the situation in, in which I was raised and to the difficulties of that situation and back to my, for instance, my nanny who mm. was a woman who lost everything during Second World War, didn't have place to live, joined our family because we have three rooms uh, and, in the house and she had none, and ended up being angel of my childhood because mm. she was the joyous, most joyous person that I've ever encountered in my life, even until now. <laughs> wow. She was singing always. Uh, and to wow. me... She ends up being this extraordinary flower that has grown in a rather nasty and dark environment. 
ability to transcend those circumstances, not to deny them, but to be oneself with joy, notwithstanding those. So I, I think looking back at situations of this sort, or even biblical traditions where one finds a similar experience, that's a source of encouragement. So that's a source for me that kind of draws me to discover something more than what meets my eye in my ordinary state of, of, mm -hmm. of being. I'm just thinking about your description of her singing. And, and that is a beautiful thing, right? To fill your, to fill the mundane or to fill one's, or to pass one's time with singing. Of course, there's, a, there's the wonder and the gift of a singing performance, but there's a lot of singing in my house. Lots of kids are just belting it out. And I love hearing it. it that is a gift. I, I know in some ways this music that, that occurs from a joyful heart that happens is the most beautiful sound you can have. And uh, I think there are also Christian leaders, Chrysostom, early Christian church father, he was always emphasizing uh, the beauty before God of the singer who doesn't know how to sing, but sings out of the beauty of heart. Mira, my daughter, sings out of tune, and I love to listen to it. <laughs> this reminds me of a, at least a title of a Joseph Pieper book, and it's Only the Lover Sings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had, we are going to get to some listener questions, but I just wanted to kind of do a little bit of catching up with you and what you've been doing. You've been writing a lot this year, and you recently shared this pretty cool Hannah Arendt quote, a writer is his life. And, uh, and you say that's true of theologians and even more of ministers. And you rightly indicate what a responsibility. I wonder if you could say a little bit about your approach to writing and why that really stuck out to you in this year of writing for you. Well, this has been uh, with me, this kind of thought has been with me for quite some time, and Arendt is not uh, the only one to emphasize it. A and some of us who write quite a bit, uh, we're in danger of having writing become our life. So rather than writer is, he is her life. And th this kind of impact that life has on writing, I think it's particularly significant when we deal with normative uh, issues or even especially writing about God is writing about what concerns us ultimately and what concerns the writer ultimately as well. And it's hard to write truthfully unless that which you write about Unless with that which you write about, you want to somehow align your life, unless you aspire to that, oh. to what you are uh, writing. And yeah. there, there is a kind of twisting that occurs in the mm. very writing itself by a life that resists the very character of, of the thing a person is writing. And in that sense, to me, it seems really important to attend to uh, what are our aspirations. I think we shouldn't think of it in terms of some kind of special holiness that I need to, one needs to achieve in order to be able to write. Well, I think of it more in terms of what are our true uh, deep aspirations. And so in, for me, then writing becomes also a kind of spiritual exercise a, a, as a way of being able to align myself with the subject matter which, uh, which I'm always taken because it's, I mean, it, it is my faith. Uh, and hence, I think especially that for theologians, and I mean, not religious studies scholars, and they're important. I mean, theologians mm. that, that take up this normative side and explicate of faith and explicate it, for them, it's very important to align lives with their aspirations, with uh, the subject matter of their writing. There's this quote. Well, yeah, the quote is often attributed to many people. I believe it was Joan Didion, but there are versions that say Stephen King said it and Dylan Thomas has a version, And but it's I write to find out what I think. I think, and I've got the one that's attributed to Joan Didion. That is, I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see and what it means, what I want and what I fear. And what I hear in you as well is you're adding this additional and perhaps more central dimension that you're writing what you want to be or what you want to become. 
I think both are true in some ways. I'm also writing to think, to find out what is it that I precisely think. So that kind of discovery in the process of writing seems really important. But on the other hand, there is this, for me, I think more important side, and namely the, the, the shaping of life. Uh, so that yeah. who ought I be in this situation here and now interfacing these uh, texts, interfacing God's revelation? That, to me, is uh, also a very important question. Mm -hmm. And, of course, writing is deeply related to reading. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your process, too, because I know enough about the way you write that it's tied up in what you're reading. And, and you, use, you use the act and the practice of reading to support that writing process. What have you been reading? How do you see it influencing the way you write? And I think a lot of our listeners would just be really fascinated to know some of the particulars of your like writing habits and like what helps and what doesn't and whatever. Well, I, I think for me, the most important thing is to start a, a project. The, the procrastination, if it happens, when it happens, it happens at a very beginning. Once I start writing, it seems to me that the, at least my experience is that the project itself is pulling me. And so mm -hmm. that ends up having the power of its own. And maybe that's because I'm a kind of person that, that, that loves closure. I can't quite live in unfinished, unclosed, <laughs> untied things. And so once I started, then I'm on the hook myself. And the reading often is associated as I go uh, searching in the writing itself, because I start relatively early to write rather than having everything finished. And then I'm, it's just the writing process it, it itself. It sounds and like a dialogue. It sounds like that you're it, describing a dialogue. It's, it is a discovery, in a sense, in dialogue with with others. And that means that reading ends up being eclectic. But it means also that uh, in the process of writing, I find there is also a little bit less reading than what I normally would do. I always think of the saying that's attributed to Paul Tillich, who said in his thick German accent, Zera Zoz who write books and there are those who read them. And the two <laughs> need not be the same. Then he experienced it. And once you, when you write, often you're so taken into the, in the formulation of things and into thinking, uh, in, in thinking through things yeah. that, that uh, there's less time for writing. But there are also wonderful books that, that one, one always discovers and can draw on. I mean, recently I was reading a book, which I found a very interesting, a short book by Burnout Society, which is kind of discussion of the society of achievement and that our primary problem, maybe he overemphasizes that, is kind of this struggle to achieve in competitive environments mm. and creates a lot of kind of typically modern maladies, Think, things of that sort. And our colleague, Drew Collins, has written this wonderful book, The Unique and Universal Christ, which is a wonderful uh, critique of the kind of this typical approach to theology of religion, exclusivist, inclusivist, and pluralist approaches. Recently, I was uh, flipping through the pages of um, the book by our friend from Switzerland, Oliver Dürr, oh, yeah. um, entitled Homo Novus, uh, which is about, huh. it's in German, unfortunately, but it, which is about possibilities of completion in of creation a new creation in the context of in a transhumanist uh, age so he's engaging uh, whole transhumanist project and i think it's a very important project for us to engage whether we're working on theologies of creation or on eschatological topics things like that or i was reading recently it's a very interesting book by paul bloom sweet spot I think oh, his yeah. most recent uh, book, which is about He's pleasures of suffering and the search for meaning, oh, with, yeah. where he tries to retrieve this idea or, or counter uh, rather the idea that we are simply pleasure seeking animals uh, and try to avoid pain, that pain is always purely instrumental and talks about pleasures in pain itself, but also suffering and also about the importance of certain forms of chosen suffering for the question of meaning. So it's a very interesting book. Things like that. It's very eclectic. I want to come back to that question of suffering and pain in a moment. But before that, I, I just want to ask, besides scripture, are there books that, that just seem to recur in your life, may, whether they're ancient or contemporary texts, 
are there, what are the, like the two or three or however many that you just are always turning back to you and you always find yourself, if not actually picking up and reading that you kind of feel tempted to? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so most, uh, I think probably I would name Luther, Martin Luther yeah. as a person to whom I always go back just about on any topic. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean I necessarily always agree with him, but he's my constant dialogue partner. Even where I disagree, I kind of disagree in Luther way, right? You know, this <laughs> yeah. joke that I've heard some sociologists tell about how one is inflected even when one kind of abandons something. Uh, I think it was in, in the time of troubles in Northern Ireland when there were there, there were kind of uh, lines separating on the line. There was post there and person was passing and they want to know whether he was Catholic uh, or Protestant. He said, I'm an atheist. And he said, are you a Catholic atheist or a Protestant atheist? <laughs> 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 because even what we push against can be inflected by that from which we uh, come to it. And yeah. so, so it is also with some of the great figures. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is experience with Martin Luther. I find also Karl Barth always a reference point, And Jürgen Moltmann is yeah. sometimes unmentioned, but he is, he is a very important presence in what I do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So you were teaching this past semester a course on suffering and the problem of evil. Is that right? It was problem of evil was the course, and it, I co-taught that with uh, a very good colleague and friend of mine who is Keith DeRose. Yep. And Keith is writing um, a book on the problem of evil entitled Horrendous Evils. And he's taking this as a kind of intellectual problem of the problem of, of evil. And he's mm -hmm. pushing against the, what was became a what became a dominant way of us thinking about problem of evil, which is which is a, a kind of free will defense of God, emphasis on the free will. Mm -hmm. And he's pushing against that, not in a sense denying the importance of that, that question of free, free will, but emphasizing inadequacies of it and is trying to find alternatives and returning more what looks like some version of John Hicks' soul-making theodicy. Uh -huh. And it's a very, it was a very interesting thing to do. Uh, we were reading his manuscript, and he's a great thinker, and mm. and it's a very important topic. It now, is, I yeah. myself am more interested in the suffering side of things, yeah. and I'm interested more in the, especially forms of resilience that are embedded or that are there in the Christian faith in the face of suffering, because I think that Christian faith, other faiths as well, but certainly Christian faith arose out of the situations of suffering. And so presents something that a kind of resource that we often leave by the wayside mm -hmm. when we think of it simply as a kind of intellectual problem, rather than simply that. I'm not dismissing it, but yeah. if we think of it as a resource for living, then it becomes also very interesting and, and it, it kind of clarifies the character of the problem that we need to address. That, this is really good. Clarifying the character of the problem, I think, is so important because the problem of evil as you described it, the intellectual problem, as opposed to maybe the existential problem, is so often uh, a problem for what we think of as the existence of God. And that's how it's always been leveraged. Insofar as it's an intellectual problem around the rationality of, of belief in a perfect God, it does, I mean, that's important so far as that goes in the, pro in the project of philosophy of religion or philosophical theology it matters. But there is that existential aspect of it where there's this other 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 very important existential side of the equation which does come down to suffering and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you took out of that course and doing that reading where do you see it going for you yeah my, my exploration of this <clears throat> of the theme obviously it's, it, it has to be aware and being framed by the larger issue of the problem uh, of evil but concentrate where i want to concentrate is on a kind of paradox that faith can both emerge and be extremely alive in situations that when you step back you might think would disprove faith. And example for me, as I mentioned earlier, my nanny, who have, if she stepped back, she might have had all reasons to say, all this thing about faith didn't help me very much. I lost everything that, that I have. 
But on the other hand, she ends up being this most joyous person just because she didn't do that. And there's a quality of life that emerged out of, out of that suffering that is absolutely uh, extraordinary. So that's a kind of a practical engagement uh, with it. We'll still have to then ask the question whether she's just believing in an illusion and the illusion helped her uh, survive. Yeah. That'll be an important question to ask, but it's important also to identify. That's what I mean, clarifying the, the issue. The same is true of my father who finds God in the, at the end of the death march mm. and whose world changes in that finding of God. Now, that to me, those to me are really interesting and important questions. Yeah. And I think they're important today because many of us, feel oppressed by the situation in which we uh, find ourselves. Yeah. It's very hard under this dark cloud to have the beauty of the character shine. And mm -hmm. yet I've seen that happen. Yeah. And that's what fascinates me. Yeah, it reminds me of this Flannery O'Connor quote that I learned from Jessica Hooten Wilson. And it's, I can with one eye squinted, take it all as a blessing. Yeah. And I love the kind of embodied, no pun intended, but visual there of yeah, yeah. having to squint one, one eye. And it's this, it's both, it kind of just, it shows like the human capacity or the human drive, the motivation to try to find the meaning and the blessing in, in what was in O'Connor's case, a lot of pain, right. physical pain from lupus and a lot of like feeling socially ostracized and struggling with romantic love and things like that. And does that connect for you at all? The one I squinted? Yeah. Uh, 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 knowing what person is doing with one eye squinted, right? Mm -hmm. Refusing to take the full field of vision and, and therefore concentrate on something that is that, that is significant or on the gestalt of reality that, that is at the moment significant. But there is also this other thing that, I mean, we I mean, were talking about earlier that I'm always struck by is I don't want to assume that the negative that I see, that I see it rightly. I think I need to learn how to re-see the negative and not yeah. just how not to how to how to see the whole thing from the perspective uh, in the gestalt that, that is given to it by by, by the positive because this yeah. negativity and the power its own power and self insinuation to me is is a significant uh, problem i see it in daily life uh, as being very significant and that's where i want to partly also also push to see to see it rightly <laughs> yeah. and truthfully and not to be too impressed by it. <laughs> That's right. But uh, to carry on the metaphor, yeah, it's like when it was, since we're, that, that I, I had no idea, I completely forgot in the moment that, but yeah, it does connect when I squinted with that, the rays of light that kind of make it through the cracks of mm -hmm. the world. And that's just like, the refraction there that light when it passes through a particular filter it can take on you know it can reveal a spectrum of color that's a good way to think about it and and it is about the mode of reception even yeah very much very much agreed and i, I think that faith faith in god from my perspective faith in god plays a, a very significant role in that and it's almost like there is this fun fundamental trust in the goodness of what is. And that fundamental trust makes the knowing, a certain kind of knowing possible that otherwise wouldn't be. And that's given with the idea of creation, especially if you think of the good creator creating world that is, that is very good. Mm -hmm. And then it allows you also, which I think is really important, to see the, the negative for what it is, both not to underplay it and not to uh, overplay it. Because it, the, there is also no point in underplaying the, the evil. The kind of rosy picture of reality hmm. is a false picture of reality. And my, my interest then is to, to find ways in which we can fully acknowledging what is, nonetheless, see the world as a gift and live in it in the joyful kinds of ways. You know, one of our listener questions did pick up on this particular theme. So it might be worth just asking and, and seeing if that's, if, the, if this is a connection or just to comp, make a comment. Jared Holsing asked about this kind of, these two different ways of, of 
thinking about evil and in the created order. And it's this, uh, quote, is this an evil world ruled by the prince of darkness with some pockets of goodness? Or is it a good world ruled by Jesus, the king of kings, with some pockets of darkness? Lots of evangelicals speak as though it's the former, that it's yeah. mostly ruled by the prince of darkness, but Jared is holding out for the latter. Where would you weigh in? Yeah, no, I, I think I'd be very much on his side. I think that's also what I would mean by the claim that goodness of creation is primordial. Yeah. The goodness of creation cannot be undone. And so the negative is only properly perceived against the backdrop of the of the positive. And in that sense, I would agree with him. What I'm, I'm a little bit um, stumbling over is the word pockets or the image yeah. of pockets. Right. So as if evils is a kind of identifiable, simply and completely isolated thing there. And uh. the good also is that, right? As if there is not a twisting of the world as a whole without it, thereby becoming full, becoming fully evil without right. thereby it be, being being completely in classical terminology of uh, completely sinful right yeah. turning into uh, the sinful reality uh, itself so that and, and that's where Luther comes in for me so that you have this idea that you're simultaneously just about in everything both justified and and sinner but the primacy is given to the goodness and to justification rather than to one's, one's sinfulness. Mm. But I, I think that's how we need to think about it. And otherwise, it's very hard to justify God's creation of the world. It's very hard to hope for the salvation of the world. If in some significant sense, the world is not in its nature such that the primacy belongs to the good. What do you make of the implications? Is there any, if you were to consider the world essentially ruled by by evil with only pockets of goodness or if you make evil primordial what does that do to to one's expression of christianity yeah that would be that would be that would be really interesting i mean one can imagine without primordial goodness being lost but pockets of the world being ruled by such sinister forces that they kind of choke the the true life in its varied expression. Mm. And the question becomes, what does one do in situations of this sort? And in some ways, one is the ray of light then. Yeah. And this simple being it will have to then suffice. And we know of situations in many places where that's exactly what people, the only thing they could do, there's nothing that could be changed. That's sometimes in the modern setting for us in terms of our expectation, it's hard to imagine. But there are situations in which nothing can change. What can change the interior self? And there, I would say, attend to the beauty of the world. Hmm. Within, do not let the circumstances encroach upon the integrity uh, of the self, even though you cannot express it in ways that you might want, and even though that the circle in which that is the case is relatively limited. I wonder if this is a good segue to thinking about the way we see the church and not just the culture, but the church seems to be at least correlated with the polarization of American political culture. Mm. And of course, uh, this has expression internationally as well. And we did get plenty of responses, folks that are worried about what are the Christian options for us if depolarizing attempts prove futile. Mm. And another, we are looking at, well, we're we're looking at a worry here that that this is the end of the middle ground. And, and so moving a, a, a little away from, from the theology of, of good and evil and suffering more into political and public theology here, what do you say about that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's that's really the loss of the middle ground is, I think, a very interesting uh, question, because obviously the loss of the middle ground has its own effects on how the each end relates to to the other. It tends to make each of the ends extreme. And in that sense, something like the middle, middle ground or the interest in, in having something like that, that middle ground. But I'm thinking that middle uh, is not a Christian category. Neither is left Christian category, <laughs> nor is right Christian uh, category. And certainly middle then isn't uh, a Christian category. Mm. And I think that might point, if that's true, that might point us in the way to proceed in a situation of high polarization. Then concentration is on the substantively what the Christian faith uh, is about and will not be highly inflected or highly shaped uh, by what actual polarities are. And then you might align with one group on one thing and with the other group on the other group, uh, and on mm. third thing align with none of them. And that would seem to me in general to be uh, the, the, the right kind of stance uh, to have. Sometimes alliances are then more possible than not, but nonetheless, I think Karl Barth was right. And I think recently, maybe a few years back, Ron Williams invoked that claim of Karl Barth that he said that Christians are unreliable allies in political domain. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. And the reason for it is is that political interests cannot define Christian commitments. There is a Lord to whom we are responsible. There is God of the universe to whom one is responsible. And that may or may not align. And if it doesn't, uh, too bad for the alliance. It doesn't align. And I think we have to have courage to go there. Indeed. I w do you react similarly to the if if we were to replace the the term middle ground with common ground, and here well, where, where common, I'll tell you where ground. I'm going with this is common life in the polis, right? In pub in public, where it's sort mm -hmm. of shared. It might not mean it might not mean these kind of platforms of agreement or little islands of agreement. You might say, where well, I'm with you on abortion, or I'm with you on gay marriage, or I'm with you on a budget ceiling, but instead is, is more about the kind of interaction that's there. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, I, I think the interest in the common life and interest in making the common life possible would be one of the substantive commitments yeah. than one, that one would have, right? So if it's not a common ground in terms of uh, let's create a compromise solution, yeah so that we can negotiate our way. Sometimes compromises are possible, sure. but on some of the fundamental issues, it, it's very hard to make those compromises. And then the question becomes, well, how does one live together even when compromises are, are not uh, possible? Is Are there modalities on which we can agree in living together? And that's also, I think, a, a strong Christian interest uh, and motivation, at least how I would think of it. And more we think of creating and patterns of relating, which make it possible for us to differ on significant issues, I think the better we will be in the long run. Mm -hmm. A pastor in Orange County, California, an Arabic pastor, his name's Adele Malik, asked, as the pandemic transfers our lives to uncertainty and Christianity in the U.S. becomes weaker as a result of the marriage between evangelicals and Trump. How do you expect the church worldwide to look in 2022? I don't know how the church worldwide is going to look. I am hoping that the church worldwide will not try to align itself with the church in the U.S. or, for that matter, in some other Western uh, countries. I also hope that the church will not be too impressed by the burgeoning nationalism, which is not simply U.S. phenomenon and problem, but is actually worldwide problem, so that we are then finding analogous types of polarizations and analogous types of alignment between Christian faith and politics in other uh, parts of the world. And I think we have to resist that. We have to push against the notion of kind of political Christianity. And I know that there are some significant movements, both in Catholic and Protestant circles, to re 
return to Christendom. I think this is profoundly mistaken. It was profoundly mistaken from the beginning, mm. and it, it it is even more profoundly mistaken now. And we have to push back. So for me, that means a return to engaged prophetic uh, Christianity in the footsteps of Jesus. One factor here that is, that kind of strikes me about Pastor Adele's question here is his pointing out lives of uncertainty. I wonder if you'd comment on living with uncertainty and how to balance that with a robust commitment to truth-seeking. What is the role of uncertainty for you? What is the how does that factor in in public theology in particular? Well, uncertainty, I think, makes things more difficult. I think creates polarizations, and that makes it more likely that you would have alignments of faiths and Christian faith and nationalism, and it makes it also more likely that people will be fearful in reacting to and setting oneself apart from precisely that alignment of faith and politics. And we see that also in in many circles, people are afraid to express what they what they think, because they would, there'll be significant losses for them, whether economically, whether socially, their friends are going to uh, abandon them. And in that sense, that creates a difficult environment. And so, and on the one hand, while I want to advocate for kind of reliance on the gospel and, and certain kind of principle disloyalty, at the same time, I can understand why that, that might be difficult uh, for people, what they may, that may create the situations of persecution. And indeed, mm-hmm. it has created persecu- situations of persecution in many countries with authoritarian regimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the presence of uncertainty really puts someone to the test. If you're uncertain where your next paycheck is going to come from, if you're uncertain yeah. whether you'll be sick, whether whether an entrepreneurial endeavor is going to fail, uncertainty really pushes someone to 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 take a stand. And uh, but that's a uh, that's a that's a challenging place to be in. That's that's very difficult. So putting things back in a theological context, David Moore on Facebook asks a wonderful, provocative question: Is theology for the religious only? Or is such a way of thinking obsolete? Yeah, so that, that, that's a very challenging uh, question. And I think it's a very important question, given also a certain kind of crisis in which theology finds itself. So, so my basic uh, ar- argument would be, or my basic position would be, is Christian faith only for religious? Or is that way of thinking, namely Christian way of thinking, obsolete? Mm. And depending how you answer that question, I think you will have answered the question about uh, theology, because I think yeah. that theology is the kind of thinking side of the faith uh, itself. And I would want to hope that uh, Christian faith isn't simply for the religious, but that it is for everyone. It's interesting that in the world to come, if we are to follow the book of Revelation, there is not going to be a, a designated sacred space. Uh, th- that is to say, the religiosity qua religiosity is not the most fundamental thing. It serves now to differentiate one from, from the other, but mm. fundamentally, it is an orientation toward, toward God revealed in Jesus Christ. And that can be a very much a kind of secular reality, yeah, worldly reality. And once one takes it as a worldly reality, then it, in principle, it becomes uh, possible for everyone to be interested. And I think uh, for centuries, that's what Christian faith was about. Any form of mission presupposes that it's not simply there for religious, but for everyone. Mm-hmm. So, Miroslav, this is the 100th episode of For the Life of the World. It's falling on January 1st, 2022. You've been on many podcasts, but this was your first foray into podcasting yourself, interviewing people and bringing them on the show. And I'm just wondering, as you 
think back to 2020 when we launched mm-hmm. the show, basically at the dawn of a global pandemic. What are some of the standout moments to you? Some of the guests that you remember, uh, or just moments that felt like light was coming through. Yeah, no. If you had asked me, I would have wouldn't have said that there were as many as a uh, hundred episodes. So I want to uh, thank you and congratulate you for all the hard work that you've put into doing all this work. And the most interesting episode for me to do were the interview episodes. I found that in terms of podcast, I almost need a live audience to be able to speak directly. So yeah. that it's a little bit more difficult for me to to give a lecture uh, or to speak simply on the podcast. And so interview ends up as a much more interesting or doable format for me. And obviously, it gives us the the opportunity to have this uh, extraordinary conversation with people who are uh, great intellectuals, uh, great writers, and who have deep insight into what is going on in various uh, different worlds, which we all uh, inhabit. So when I think about interviews with Charles Taylor or Mary Marilyn Robinson or Chris Wyman or for that matter Willie Jennings or mm. Kerry Day I can go on and on those were very useful and often especially with Willie and with Kerry to the moment speaking to the moment yeah. in a way that was quite quite extraordinary and that side of things speaking to the issues of the moment seem to me really interesting and really important in in the podcast. Yeah, so there is a place for scripted narrative storytelling in, in podcasting, and those are wonderful and fun to try to create and produce. But, but I think you're right that there is something beautiful about dialogue as it happens extemporaneously, intuitively, and, and when you really do inhabit a moment with someone when you're fully present to it, when you're paying attention and listening and that, that allows for something deeper to come out. And I'll just note one myself, what listeners might not recognize is I'm sitting in on a lot of these conversations, almost all of them, in fact, listening to uh, each of you and producing. And, and there was a moment when you were interviewing Pastor Ivan Mawaride of Zimbabwe. And, and he was describing his experience in prison and um, ignore these walls were the Mm -hmm. three, were the three words. And I just kind of witnessed you (laughs) kind of like really be impacted by that. And that was a special moment for me because we were hearing someone whose theology was truly lived, whose commitments were uncompromising. And, and he was opening up in a way that you really do have to be truly present to, to kind of tell the truth in that way. And to bear witness in that way, that was a special moment. And for him to have received those words as an almost reverse kind of prophetism for somebody who was uh, de facto criminal yeah. in that in that prison, and then advice to the pastor: ignore these walls. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a part of this, and it's just a joy to be doing it with you and the team here. Listeners, thank you for your questions. Thank you for responding to this call. We hope that your 2022 is full of peace and goodness and and the kind of challenges, the kind of suffering that can draw a deeper faith and draw out a deeper goodness and connection. All the best. Thank you, Evan, for all your hard work and uh, beautiful results. Thanks, Mirsav. Thanks, friends. We will be back next week, so keep an eye out for highlights, readings, lectures, and other best of moments from the past 100 episodes of For the Life of the World. And on May 1st, we'll be back with brand new episodes. Thanks for listening, friends. Peace. is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured theologian Miroslav Wolf. Production assistance by Martin Chan, Nathan Jowers, and Logan Ledman. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edit and produce the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday, sometimes midweek. If you're new to the show, 
Welcome, friend. Hit subscribe in your favorite podcast listening app, and we'd love your feedback. Ratings and reviews in Apple Podcasts are particularly helpful, but we're just as happy to hear from you by email at faith at yale.edu. We read each comment and do our best to respond and improve the show, bringing you the people and topics that you want to hear. And if you're a regular listener, it's a huge honor that you stick with us from week to week. So I'll ask you to step up and join us. Help us share the show. Behind those three dots in your podcast app, there's an option to share this episode by text or email or social media. If you took a brief moment to send your favorite episode to a friend or share with the world, not only would you be supporting the show, you'd be sparking up a great conversation around stuff that matters with people that matter. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week.